And the microbiome has been really interesting in the last couple of years and how that shift and how the shift that everybody's undergoing through might explain some of the, the new things that we're seeing. Um, here's something we uh, have decided not to do over, um, uh, over uh, Katie's uh, uh, dead body. Uh, uh, the uh, last um, uh, agreement from the, uh, well, is it just going on its own? I guess it is. Uh, uh, this is um, that's something that um, uh, is controversial, I think. And I think the, uh, the pediatric panel that put this out is now beginning to look at it again uh, and to say, wait a minute. Uh, allergists have been doing uh, skin testing and, uh, for food and for other things um, uh, since you know, allergy existed. Um, but the concern was that uh, there might be irritant or non-associated uh, non, uh, 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 issues that occur in skin testing that would put children at risk for vitamin deficiencies, for, um, uh, for uh, poor growth, and for uh, deficiencies in calcium, vitamin A, B, D, folic iron, zinc, and iron. So what's happening now, I think, after that big blast statement, is that people are beginning to look at it a little bit different, say, wait a minute, let's, let's tune this up a little bit. So before you stop doing any uh, skin testing and, and atopic dermatitis, uh, hang on, this is a pendulum, it'll swing back and forth, and I think it's gonna swing back here. Uh, so step therapy is indicated in atopic dermatitis. Um, you always know the first step is uh, the skin emollient uh, therapy and uh, um, maybe antihistamines. I've never found them that effective in, in, uh, um, in atopic dermatitis. Um, Singular Bill Storm uh, uh, suggested that we add in that. Um, topical uh, steroids, PDE4 inhibitors. Uh, the topical capital uh, calcineurin inhibitors, which is still very difficult to, um, uh, to, uh, um, to get authorization for. Uh, that's one of the funny political things that happened through the years when these uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors were developed and they were so safe. Um, and they started advertising to children even and cartoon figures about uh, super safe. Um, FDA said, don't do that. And uh, the companies basically said, hey, it's America, we can do what we want to do. Um, they rapidly found themselves in a black box situation, and black boxes to pediatricians mean something. Now, black boxes and other things don't necessarily mean it, but this one really stuck. Uh, and even though the Academy of Pediatri uh, Pediatrics and um, everybody concerned with uh, dermatitis, once it changed, uh, FDA has been pretty, um, uh, pretty difficult about taking some of the, uh, the warnings off of these, and therefore it's been very difficult to get uh, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the things that we would really like to have on the market again, or on the, on the market where we could use them again. Now, here's a little practice pearl. Um, I know you may know something about it, but uh, let's say we got a person here with eczema, and let's say that it's, um, it's the usual thing, which is flexor poles and uh, below and beyond. Um, the idea of using wet wraps has, uh, has kind of left us uh, in the last few years. We got to start thinking about uh, the way we used to treat things before we had all these there. And so people that are older like me can remember when we had nothing to treat this with, except that you know, we walked up a hill in the snow and, and treated these things with, uh, with uh, emollients. But what a common, easy thing to do, I do use is wet wraps. Um, I'll take a pair of socks from an individual and uh, land socks. Uh, white uh, will come in and we'll cut some uh, loops out of that, like a sweatband, um, soak them, uh, and put them over these areas. Uh, and uh, we do that two or three times a day. Um, you know, before school, after school sometimes, after before bedtime, it works. Um, you know, the, the problem with eczema is not enough water in the skin, so one of the ways is to put water back. Um, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do sometimes. We used to, used to use things called zoot suits, where 
uh, would have, it was like a reverse, uh, reverse scuba suit. And uh, at the last hope, we'd hospitalize children and put them in wet wraps in the hospital. You never hear about that anymore, but those were things that we uh, did uh, uh, before, the, before the day. So the step therapy at the last step has to do with uh, biologics, with immunosuppressants, cytosporins, PUB, and uh, uh, all the materials that are now commonly available to us that were just uh, witchcraft a few years ago. So here's, a, here's, a, here's one way, Dr. Weibel's gonna talk about it, an easier way to, um, to do uh, um, the grading of the disease. Uh, this is uh, called SCORAD. And SCORAD basically uh, takes each one of the, uh, first of all, they look and see what's the, what's the surface area involved. Uh, and then they ask for an intensity score, and they do it with erythema, uh, edema, oozing, um, excoriations up on the B, B section now, uh, pigmentation, and xerosis, and give them a score, one to three, total score. Then a subjective score, which is box C, and that's pruritus over the last three days on a scale of one to 10, and sleep loss for the last three days um, for uh, skin. And the score ad uh, formula, which looks daunting, but actually turns out pretty easy to manipulate, uh, in this case would be surface area 50%, intensity 12, subjective 12. Um, there's the formula, and uh, there's the answer. Uh, and when you look at uh, eczema, uh, mild, uh, moderate, and severe, uh, it's pretty easy to see that somebody that's got intense inching and is losing sleep uh, is going to be uh, a graded, um, uh, a graded in, uh, individual that would meet the criteria for more aggressive therapy. Now, the, the, the problem is with any of these scoring areas, they're only a couple of days. We're dealing with chronic disease, and we're cutting out a section of three days in order to qualify for some pretty uh, significant medications. Uh, and this is insurance uh, 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 issue. Uh, there are medical directors. Um, used to be you'd have a medical director that was a retired proctologist or something, and you could talk them on in, in almost anything. But now, they're getting pretty tough, uh, and they want uh, specific uh, lines. And when I take over Blue Cross Blue Shield's um, um, uh, biologic thing in, in you know, the next couple of months, as I, it's my next career, then I'll change all this. <laughs> we'll see. So interleukins are the first thing. What is an interleukin? Um, well, that's what it looks like. Um, it, that's kind of difficult to, to grasp, right? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a mass of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, proteins. Uh, there are a group of cytokines, secreted proteins, signals that are expressed and secreted by white blood cells, um, as well as some other blood cells. The human gene in, uh, encodes more than 50 of these. We know a lot about uh, probably half of them, uh, but the term interleukin um, uh, was, was accepted from inter as a means of uh, uh, communications, leukin. Uh, deriving from the fact that many of these proteins are produced by lymphocytes and uh, uh, leukocytes, act on leukocytes. Okay, now if they say that 14 times in a row, uh, you'll pick it up. What is an interleukin? Um, basically, interleukins are just messengers. You know, they're, they're telling the immune system uh, uh, what's wrong, what's to do. Um, there are very few states where there have been uh, an absence of leukotrienes analyzed. I mean, there are plenty of hyper um, immune systems, but not many low ones. Um, so I've chosen to uh, simplify this as I usually do and say that interleukin-4 uh, and interleukin-13 are the ones that we're going to be looking at today. And these are, these are nasty guys that, uh, that we try to stop uh, or that we think about. So the next time you think about an interleukin, you can think about uh, those old uh, concepts. And there are lots more here that are running around in the background that we don't even know about. You know, in early 97, there's only been 50, maybe just 3,000 of them. Uh, we'll learn, by the way. Uh, but uh, interleukins and atopic dermatitis are considered to be an issue because they're high. 
So you can measure interleukin-4, 13, 17, 22, 31, 33. Uh, right now, and there are probably 15 more that are in various stages. Uh, you'll find them high. Any topic dermatitis, you'll find increased inflammation, and that contributed to barrier dysfunction and, of course, to itch. So the goal uh, was be to try to produce something that would inhibit the action of these uh, materials. And uh, it's not really very difficult. In fact, you know, you can go on the internet today and buy interleukins. Uh, Harvey, you, you, you've been going about immunizing yourself to, you know, animal products and things. Uh, here, buy you some interleukins, you know. <laughs> They're for sale. Um, you know, uh, they, they come in all varieties. It's already been worked out. Uh, now, getting a drug out of that is another story. Of course, you don't have to worry about those kind of IRB things, you know, so you can go ahead and inject yourself with stuff. Okay. I should laugh. I mean, we, these, we do stuff to ourselves all the time that are crazy. I remember when we were trying to find a, the mechanism of Zolier um, 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 anaphylactic reactions. I froze it, injected it in myself, um, uh, microwaved it, left it out, mixed it wrong, mixed it right. I could not produce a positive reaction on myself. So I never was able to say, oh, as an incipient, I'm so, I kid you, uh, Harvey, but I've done it too. And I also have a, in the back of my car, I have a, a yeah, I know. <laughs> I figure it would feel vindication, you know. I also have a, a box in my car with old EpiPens. Uh, they date back as long as 12 years ago. And uh, I've, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're in the car, they, they freeze, they uh, boil, uh, and it's a big summer activity. It used to be in my clinic, uh, where we take the oldest EpiPen out and jab Dr. Lanier. <laughs> and so and it's pulse raid. Was okay, that one's still good, you know. <laughs> and we always thought it was a big issue, the, the, the short, short dates on uh, EpiPens. Uh, okay, so here we are trying to find some way to stop these, um, these primary immune uh, issues. Now, there, you know, there are plenty of other important um, uh, interleukins um, than just 13 and 4, but these are the ones that have been kind of centered on in the last couple of years. How do you stop them? Well, there's been some revolutionary biologics that have resulted from the studies. And um, I think for atopic dermatitis, um, you look at and... Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to do the names. I sometimes get them and sometimes don't, but uh, Dipilimab I can get. Uh, uh, Leclizumab, I got that one. Uh, Trachinolab, uh, <laughs> missed that one. Okay. So if we're just doing, since we're doing this uh, verbally, we don't have to worry too much about, you know, writing them down. So you guys, don't, uh, you can take my lead here. So Dipilimab is the uh, IL-4, IL-13. Uh, the Leclizumab is... Uh, anti-IL-13, and uh, the one that's on the market now the, uh, is Aubrey, which is IL-13. So all of them have got advantages and disadvantages, um, and what we're going to do is to look at uh, how these things work. Um, what do they do? How long can you have them on? What are the dangers, risks, benefits? Um, this is the, just an absolute miracle of uh, anti-IL-4 and anti-13. Uh, this was in the British German, uh, uh, Journal of Dermatology. And it just shows what eight weeks of, uh, or 16 weeks now, of, um, of uh, therapy can do for people who have had this mess all their lives. Now, I missed the introduction slide that I had because I had a kid on there that I'd been following since he was two months of age, and he's now in his uh, 30s. And... Uh, we had just died with him and his mother for so many years. Um, and um, the advent of this was just uh, uh, startling. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it. It's just a blockbuster. Um, in fact, it, uh, uh, it, was, it was so good that, uh, it, uh, um, that it just revolutionized our thinking. So you've all seen the, the, the studies of IgA, IG, uh, EZ, BSA, uh, sleep, poem, um, those are all uh, measuring scales, and they just, uh, they just drop like a rock. Um, so these are the kind of things that we really are used to seeing. I used to have uh, children, uh, women, that 
who had learned um, how, to, how to use uh, steroids. They'd save them until um, they were going to graduate or had their photographs taken or if they were getting married. Um, they knew they were going to get a flare, um, but they learned skillfully to use them. Um, and this drug has just taken that away. I've had um, people with hand eczema, a uh, guitarist that needed their hands um, to be saved. So I'm, I'm just a big, uh, uh, a big rooter for this uh, particular uh, medication. Uh, it is odd, though, that you see uh, uh, this, uh, especially in depictions, you see that it increases eosinophilia. Uh, don't let that bug you. There's nothing ever been shown to say that that's a bad thing. But you will notice as you follow up, if you do blood testing, you'll find some, um, some eosinophilia increase that uh, is because eosinophilic, uh, it affects eosinophilic tracking to issues. Most of the effects we had thought was a combination of, of uh, IL-4 and IL-13 in this drug. And, and I noticed when I was looking at the PI uh, this morning uh, that at least in two of the situations they gave the, the, that um, um, uh, that uh, depiction has been labeled as an anti-IL-4 antibody, period. Um, so uh, it's a change from my thinking. I would have to ask the people today to help me with it. And I, we got some we got some super peeper coming up uh, when Dr. Gross is going to give us some, some, uh, some detail on this, which is why I found uh, uh, easy to, to go over the top and skate. There's some problems with interleukin. There's some conjunctivitis. Um, it's, it's more common than you'd think. Uh, some of the studies show up to 28% of people have it, but it may not be very significant. It may not be uh, that you have to discontinue the drug, uh, that you have to do anything, but it's a fairly common thing. Um, the, uh, the theories of causation for this is that uh, you get a reduction in ocular cytokines that allows uh, demodex night mites, you have to look for those carefully, uh, causing an IL-17 mediated uh, inflammation. Uh, you get the eosinophilia after develop administration, and you get systemic IL-13 inhibition uh, that indirectly leads to a reduction in goblet cells um, of the eye and other places. And sometimes it's a, almost like a rosacea-like uh, syndrome. So you see um, uh, bilateral uh, conjunctivitis. Don't panic. Uh, treat it the way you usually treat it. Um, but uh, you treat it like it does in allergic conjunctivitis. You'd rinse the eyes. You'd wet the agents. Uh, you'd use ocular antihistamines. The problem is that um, you, you can't use antihistamines usually because antihistamines dry, or at least most of them do. So you may complicate things if you hit uh, people hard with antihistamines. And if you have to get to the point where you use steroids, eye drops on people, which are you know, commonly available, none of us uh, uh, shy from that. Uh, you need to consult an ophthalmologist if a baseline is indicated. Okay, now this is a situation that's different though this is, uh, if you find somebody that just has one eye involved and there's no sight problems, no drainage, um, doesn't hurt, uh, who do you send them to? Do you send them to an ophthalmologist? Now, this is a situation that you call Sarah Connors. <laughs> and those of you that didn't get that need some help. Uh, yeah. um, uh, there are two medications on the boards um, uh, for, uh, for depiction, uh, Aubrey and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, depiction. There's some things that we talked about yesterday in a meeting that you really need to know. You need to say that people have tried and failed other medications, um, including um, uh, Montelicast. And their body surface area is over 10%. But hands, see if you have hands involved, that's, that's over 10%. Um, so, you know, you're, you can still do hand eczema with this. You have to score it. And most of the time, the suggestion had been that you live it, uh, that you have to have phototherapy a couple times a week for six weeks. Uh, <laughs> those of us in Phoenix and, uh, and uh, uh, Texas just say, hey, we, <laughs> we get plenty of phototherapy uh, here. Although that may not be true since we're all spending our time like moles underneath the ground there. Um, uh, if you're gonna use some of the other things, uh, 
uh, you, uh, uh, well, Dr. Wyden will talk about uh, the, the JAK inhibitors. But uh, Lori, is there anything we missed that we should have had from yesterday's discussion? No. Is that it? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So here's a big, uh, Dr. Lanier is a little dyslectic. Um, um, so here's the big question that we're going to ask the panel. Uh, would you choose to put a patient on an injectable drug that may be semi-permanent with, uh, with a low potential for side effects or an oral one with known sure side effects but can be stopped and monitored? This is the question that I'm going to be asking uh, our little panel. And our, uh, the other thing that we'll say is, when do you stop? So this panel will come up here in a second and we'll get uh, Dr. Storms if he's avail available uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Weibel and uh, uh, Dr. Weldon to comment on. Because these are the things that get us. When do we stop? Okay. <laughs>